double computer. Okay, no. so we're on to our second talk of the um, morning, and we're going we're to hear Gemini, Elastic Proofs for Diverse Environments. Take it away. Hello, hi. Um, so, yeah, this talk is concerned mostly with proving um, very, very large circuits. This is joint work with Jonathan Butto, Alessandro Chiesa, and Yun Song Hu. So um, we're going to focus on succinct arguments. You already heard the description just in the previous talk, but essentially we have this dialogue between the prover and the verifier. And at the end of this dialogue, the prover should be able to convince the verifier that there exists a witness that satisfies some relation. Arguments means that the security of this protocol relies on computational assumptions. Succinct means that the verification power is, uh, <laughs> is uh, um, less than the, the witness, is less than the complexity of the witness. We will actually focus on pre-processing succinct arguments, which means that the verification time is, um, is even like lower than the, than the size of the statement. So we put a lot of effort in this kind of proof systems. You know, Snarks belong in this class, and um, um, we, we know how to do them. We spent a lot of time improving the proving time, the verification time. Now we were almost optimal in both cases, um, but not so much on space. And uh, in fact, if right now we were to use uh, practical proof systems, like Marlin or Spartan, um, for like millions of gates, they would just like crash. We, we are not able to prove very large instances. And um, as we sort of uh, try to deploy these proof systems in the real world, so it grows this, the, the need for uh, being able to prove larger and larger circuits. For instance, if we just consider the compression function of charge 256, this is like uh, 30,000 constraints. Um, if you put it in a Merkle tree or you try to verify different transactions, you're already far outside benchmarks that uh, uh, we put in papers. And if you multiply by like a thousand times, because you're like um, doing ZK rollups, then uh, you you really cannot do not have a proof system that works in the real world that can uh, can deal with uh, these sort of circuits. Um, so there has been already some literature on uh, how to build a space efficient succinct arguments, um, mostly TCC papers. Um, initially, we've been working a lot on uh, um, recursive proofs. Um, as a mean of preserve time and space, as Yusef just mentioned in the previous talk. And, um, but more recently, we've been talking more about streaming provers and provers can, that can produce a proof after receiving the inputs as a stream. What do I mean by this? I mean that in practice, the prover gets um, as input a stream of data, then runs, it will run actually in a logarithmic space and then produce a proof. In theory, in, sorry, in, in, in even more in a, in a real-world scenario, what do I imagine? Imagine my phone that is unloading an instance and then producing a proof. And, and in theory, what do I mean? I mean that we have a Turing machine that does not have the, as input, uh, the input in random access, but has an oracle, and this oracle can give me next element, next element, next element, and then I can also ask to seek at the beginning of the file. And uh, this Turing machine must run in, uh, in sort of log space. Um, we build on the top of this model and we introduce this idea of elasticity. What does it mean elasticity? It means that you have a proving algorithm that admits two different implementations. One that is time efficient, one is space efficient. The verifier couldn't care less about which setup was used in order to create this proof. In particular, we build, a, we, we say that these creatures exist and we propose a proof system that for circuit satisfiability that admits two different realization. One that is linear time and one that is log space. The other we would like to have the two of them, but until then we have this sort of different type of configuration. And in particular, the proof is independent from the configuration that we choose and the verification run in log time. In addition to that, um, our proof system has the peculiarity that it is possible to move from space efficient to time efficient in the middle of the proving execution, in the execution of the prover. And we will see what this means in a second. In addition to that, the um, space complexity uh, the, the complexity of the space efficient prover, this was also known in previous works, but we improve on that in that if the circuit has a particular structure, it's like an inner product relation or it's a, a funny state machine, then this can actually go down to n log n. Um, we build this proof system for an NP complete um, relation, rank one constraint system. Why do we choose this relation? Because it's what people use in practice. And um, it is easy that uh, to build a, 
this relation from a circuit, what do I mean by as a circuit? I mean uh, additional multiplication gates. And um, if I have this circuit with additional multiplication gates, then I can build uh, matrices A, B, and C, where size will depend on the size of the circuit, um, for which um, if the circuit is satisfied, then there will exist a Z, possibly different from zero, uh, for which this is satisfied. And this dot here means Hadamard product. How do I build it? Very easy. In A, I put the left inputs, left wires for the multiplication gate. So one, one, and then all zeros. In B, I put the right input wires. And in C, I put the output wires. What does it mean? It means that if I do a z now, I get z0 plus z1, bz, z2, multiplication of them, z3. I do this for all the multiplication constraints. There you go. I enforce that the circuit is satisfied. Now, if I give you this relation as input to the prover, then the prover can build the proof. But what does it mean to have streaming access to this relation? Well, we define it. And uh, it means for us that I give you streaming access to um, the vector z, so I give you the element one by one, first to last. I give you access to the matrices, but what does it mean to give you streaming access to a matrix? It has two dimensions. It means that I give you access in row major and in column major. The prover decides which one to take. In addition, I will give you also what we call the computation trace, which is like essentially like the addition in the circuits, namely az, bz, and cz. And if the um, the circuit has a particular structure, again, it is possible to build this inner product in a space-efficient manner inside. And in fact, in the paper, we have this notion of composability of streams, where you can, uh, given as input many streams, you can build a new stream that can be fed into another procedure. So all these relations are linear relations. So what I'm going to talk about is what I think is sort of the cornerstone protocol here, which is the inner product. Once we have inner products, it's very easy to do matrix vector multiplication, and it's very easy to do Hadamard product. And uh, for the more technical people, what I'm going to provide is a polynomial interactive proof for inner product. This protocol will be later composed with a polynomial commitment scheme. And in our paper, we have this theorem that says if you have an elastic idealized protocol, if you have an elastic commitment scheme, then guess what? You can combine them, and the result is elastic still. So there is something that is already elastic and that has been going on for a, for a while in the literature, and these are like protocols that are inspired from sum check or folding arguments. And all these protocols have this uh, nice structure where I go from a, a claim of size n into a claim of half the size. And then I invoke it recursively until I end up with a claim that is trivial, that is size 1, and that the verifier can check immediately. In particular, at every round, the verifier is sending me one random coin, public coin, and uh, the verifier is using this randomness to what we call fold the instance. For instance, um, I can do even or not folding, which is sort of more inspired from FFT, or I can do left and right folding. That's essentially the same thing. Um, and as I go on through the protocol, I will have like these linear combinations of the randomness with pieces of the vector. Until at the end, the verifier will have to check these uh, sort of smaller instances, which are actually multivariate polynomial evaluations, or at least that's the way that I want you to see them for now. Now, we know how to run these protocols in linear time. Why? Because over here I'm doing, oops, something is that, okay. Because over here I'm doing n divided by two multiplications, then I will do n divided by four, then I will do n divided by eight. This is linear, no? And, um, but how do I do it in a spatial efficient manner? And uh, actually we prove that you can, we show that you can also do it in, uh, in linear time, construct the foldings. How do we do it in a space efficient? Well, you have as input the stream of F. What is the stream of F? Are all the coefficients, no? One by one by one, et cetera, et cetera. And I keep a stack. And in this stack, I can start putting and feeding elements from the stream. And as soon as I have two elements of the same level, well, I fold them with their respective randomness. And then I keep ingesting elements as as soon as I have two elements of the same level, then I fold them. Again of the same level, I fold them. Until I end up with the coefficients that I want, and then I can return it. How much space does this thing take? Log n, because I will keep at most two elements for every level. How much time will it take? Still linear, no? Because I'm doing n divided by two multiplications, plus n divided by four, plus n divided by eight, and so on and so forth. And so at the end, because I will have to run this protocol log times, I will end up with a protocol that can use log space 
and overall n log n time. But this protocol has another particularity that is sort of the sort of the, the little nudge of, uh, of our proof system that you can exploit this recursive structure in such a way that you can fix a memory budget. You can say, now my prover is going to take one gigabyte of memory. You fix a threshold and then you can run the space efficient prover until you reach a level where the instance can be written in memory. And then from then you can use the time efficient algorithm. So you have a proof system that can run optimally for certain sizes. And as soon as you hit like a, very large instances, you will use streaming algorithms. Okay, so this is sort of the, the basic idea. And um, once you reach the end, what you have is this uh, sort of multivariate evaluation that needs to be taken care of. And um, sort of in the ideal world, when we when we do work with uh, with polynomial IOP, um, we have these uh, very finite tasks for a multivariate evaluation. Um, and in reality, what does it mean? It means that the, the, the prover will commit to a polynomial and then provide an evaluation proof. Actually, in the paper, we're able to reduce this multivariate query to univariate queries, generically. And uh, why is this useful? Because then we can get rid of the multivariate part and use just a univariate polynomial commitment scheme. Why is this useful? Because if I end up using things like KZG, the verification time is much more efficient. We're talking about log pairings versus two pairings. It's, uh, it's relevant. And, um, and so what I want to do now is spend a little bit of time talking about how do you build an elastic commitment scheme. Um, so we work on KZG, and uh, KZG is uh, sort of a pretty streaming friendly. Um, just as a reminder, we already chat talked about this a bit in the previous talk, but um, the commitment key is these uh, consecutive powers of tau, where tau is selected during setup and is never shared afterwards, not with the prover, not with the verifier. And the, the commitment algorithms will consist in uh, the, the multiscalar multiplication of the commitment key with the polynomial f. Does it mean to do this in a space efficient manner? It means that I have the coefficients of f, no? In a streaming way, so one by one. And the same for the commitment key. And I will build a commitment on the top of it by accumulating the product of these elements. So I will do the, the scalar multiplication of these things together. Now, how do I do evaluation? Evaluation in KZG is a uh, Euclidean division by the polynomial x minus alpha. So I get the quotient, I get the reminder. The reminder is the evaluation of f in alpha, and the quotient is the thing that I'm going to commit to. So what do we do? Uh, we essentially do pen and pencil division by x minus alpha. We get the streaming of f, top to last coefficient, and then we produce the stream of Q by using Ruffini's law. So the first is the first of the quotient. Then I apply recursively by using this, I apply Ruffini's law by using, that requires me to store only the previous coefficient of the quotient. And so this can be done in a constant memory. Okay, so now we have this uh, polynomial commitment scheme, we have this polynomial IOP, we put them together, we get a proof system that is elastic. We try to go down to the implementation, we, we actually implement it. And implementing it requires quite a some engineering effort. Why? Because you end up having to build the whole polynomial commitment stack, and we have uh, an implementation for a multivariate polynomial commitment scheme, and one for KZG. You have to build in a product, and from here you can build directly as NARG, but um, what we go up for is a pre-processing snark. So we have to build, the prover needs to be even more work, and there are some other sub-protocols that need to be implemented, some of which are not necessarily trivial to implement in a streaming fashion. And in addition to that, because we have this elastic notion, you have to implement them twice, essentially, because you have to build a time-efficient implementation and then the space-efficient implementation, and then how to move from one to the other. And so given the that we have this sort of modular framework, we started trying to push some stuff into artworks so that it can be also reused into other projects. So for instance, now we have uh, three different implementations of KZG in artworks. And uh, for instance, for novices or PhD students, it would be a nice project to try to see whether these can all be merged and we can have a unique implementation that is both space efficient and time efficient depending on the setup that you want. And that has, for instance, other things like uh, multi multi point proofs. And um, just more on the technical side, how do we implement them? We, this is all implemented in Rust, and um, there are many ways in which these things can be implemented in Rust. One of them is by using the stream uh, 
the stream libraries of Rust, which provide sort of a generic interfaces. But we actually go for iterators. So if you are familiar with, like, with Python, we are really just using iterators for building streams over elements and then composing them. But because Rust has this very strong time system, type system, we end up having to embed within the type the whole computation tree. So if you have a matrix and then you're doing matrix vector operations and then you're doing an algebraic caching on the top, you have this type that gets more and more complicated and you have to work with that. And this is the price for having a very efficient implementation. And so we end up benchmarking these and um, sort of uh, what is the takeaway from this? Is that um, while uh, in papers, generally we stop at like millions of gates, so around two to the 20, um, we go up until two to the 37. This is like statistical parameter security. <laughs> and uh, um, even if we try to use our own time prover for uh, like on, on a large machine that has 72 gigabytes of memory, we stop at around two to the 27. And so all of this space that you see here, these are the only things that we can recover through streaming techniques. We also have some uh, stats for pre-processing that stop a bit earlier, but I wanted to stop and, and think about one thing. In the theorem, we have this n log square n, and this line is a, is a straight line. And the reason for this is that the log factor doesn't really kick in, and the biggest, and I mean, this is sort of a general thing for proof system, the biggest overhead is still, uh, the, are still the cryptographic operations. The multiscalar multiplication is really what takes most part in a proof system, and that's why we don't have really this, uh, this low square factor kicking in yet. And the same goes for space. If I set up my space budget to be large enough, in our case around one gigabyte, then uh, even though the, log is, the, the space is supposed to grow logarithmically, um, we have this nice flat line where you can just let a prover run for as much time as you want, and it will just occupy one gigabyte until the end of the execution. And uh, yeah, so the bottom line is if you care about logarithmic factor, you should also care about constants. And um, so yeah, these are some resources and sort of wrapping up, uh, we have this proof system that is sort of a, this, uh, this idea of elasticity is essentially you have a proof system that can be implemented in a time efficient way or in a space efficient way. And we find a way of also merging the two together. Thank you. Thank you for the cool talk. That was, yeah, really cool. Um, okay, I, I'll start with my question because no one else, whilst everyone's thinking of another one. Um, have you got a, a cool application of this? Is there a cool application where you really want to prove something that's so huge you can't get it in memory? ZK rollups, I think, are one of them. Like, you have a lot of transactions that you need to prove uh, at once and you need to provide a proof for it. And these transactions are really like in the order of thousands of them. And you have maybe. I think you've got many Merkle trees, so you've got, you've got to do pro prove many hashes at once, so, yeah. okay. Or so like hash chains. Thousands times the size yeah. of the hash function is really quite big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we also chatted with some of the Falcon people, but I think for them it's also important to uh, have the proofs that are small. In our case, our proof are logarithmic size, our log size, with the size of the circuit. Okay. Well, uh, yep. Just uh, had a quick, a quick question. Did you look at other polynomial commitment that are streaming friendly, or is it just KZG? Mm, so in KZG, the particularity, I guess, is that we are doing division by a low degree polynomial, and that's really what buys us this idea of streaming easily. Um, if I already move into Lagrange basis, where I have to divide potentially by a polynomial that has a high degree, then I don't know how to do streaming. Other polynomial commitment, like PST, which admits a trusted setup, uh, they, we can also do streaming on them. Like uh, bullet post like or uh, fly based? So uh, these are more like inner products, products and on them, on them, yeah, they, they, I guess the idea there is uh, similar to inner product, I think. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so on a general level, how do you see the, the future of scale? I mean, I, I understand this is like a very serious problem, but do you think it's like distributing the prover or streaming? Uh, I don't know. Um, I think there is uh, there are multiple directions. No, there is the streaming direction. There is the direction of uh, recursing and then like incrementally verifiable computation or recursive proofs. And then there is also the MPC direction. And I'm not really sure which one will take off. Um, and also I think um, Maybe there are even in different applications. Like if you do recursion, you have to embed the verifier circuit into the prover and this is a big overhead. Whereas if you do streaming, maybe it's easier. 
And uh, if you do MPC as well, I don't know. I, I really have no idea. Thanks for the talk. Um, obviously, what would be better it would be to have both space and time efficiency, so you wouldn't have to switch. Yeah. But it wasn't so clear from your presentation, to me at least, um, when you presented the streaming version for the inner product argument, I think it was slide 15 or so, um, why you wouldn't be able to get also optimal time? Mm -hmm. So um, when, you're, when you're folding each time, you will have a, an instance of size n divided by two that then you fold in n divided by four. When you're doing streaming, you cannot store the partial instance, that the partial folding in memory. So every time you have to go through the previous folding to build the next one, because you cannot store it in memory, literally. And so um, I think there is really this, uh, on, on the bigger level, I think there is really this memory space, uh, this, uh, this space and time trade-off that is very common in like, uh, I don't know, dynamic programming or like DVD Tempera, where you have, uh, you can either choose to use a lot of space and then you have a fast algorithm. So you have a spatially efficient one, but then you have a higher time complexity. I think it really boils down to that. And I don't, I'm not sure it's even possible. Yeah, but good question, thanks. Any other questions? Going once, going twice? No, okay, thank you very much. That was really cool, cheers. <laughs>